The good news about Christianity is the foundation of the Christian faith is not Christians, it's, it's what we find at Easter. The foundation is not Christian, it's Easter. And so, um, in spite of all those difficult questions that you may have unanswered, like, I want to know why good things happen to this, bad things happen to this good person I loved, or I prayed for my mother, and because of that, nothing really happened. And so, I need help with these questions. I need help with these things that are going wrong in my mind, and I can't get myself together, all right? And so, you know, it's, it's hard to work through questions, and, and many times there's not answers to the hard questions we ask, but the foundation of the Christian faith is, is Easter. It's not having answered questions, all right? And so think about this. We're gathered today with over 2.2, according to 2010, 2.2 billion believers around the world celebrating Jesus. And that was 2010 numbers, and so I know our church has grown a little bit, so it's a little more than 2.2 billion. If, nobody thought that was funny all day long, but I'm going to keep saying it, people. <laughs> Um, like, uh, you know, how, how in the world are there 2.2 billion Christians or more today? Because Jesus, this guy that we build everything on, he was a Jewish carpenter born in a backwater called Nazareth. He didn't travel more than 30 miles from his house. He never owned a home. He never had kids. He never wrote a book. He was never recorded. He's just a guy who gathered people together and talked to them in a wilderness, you know? Like, like why is Christianity what it is today? And so uh, that's, that's interesting because, you know, there's no real plausible explanation for why the church even exists or why there is something like that. Maybe you've heard the name Nero. Nero was an emperor. He was an emperor in Rome. And the only thing he's known for is being a sadistic freak and trying to kill Christians by feeding them the lions and cutting off their heads and lighting them on fire and making blowtorches out of them. Like, this is a whacked out, weird guy. The only reason you know about Nero is because of his relationship to a Jewish carpenter. Maybe you've heard of Caesar Augustus. And definitely every year at Christmas, when they read the Christmas story, the name Caesar Augustus is mentioned. He was an emperor in Rome. He was the first emperor in Rome. And because of him, like, like uh, uh, you, you hear his name, but you don't know about any of his legislation. You don't know what he did. You don't know any of that. You just know that he's related to this simple Jewish carpenter, and his name is read all over the world in places you've never been in languages you don't know. And we're aware of Caesar Augustus because of Jesus like, how in the world is there a church today? How in the world has the church survived? Matter of fact, after Jesus died, you know, the church survived almost 400 years without even a New Testament. They didn't say, turn to the book of Romans. It's like, let me tell you what I, like, it was just different, you know? How did the church survive? Well, the answer to these questions uh, it comes from Easter, right? Let's talk about movements now. Now, movements, like Christianity, all happen the same way. A charismatic leader steps up and says, I don't believe this is the way things should be. This is the way the world should be. And that person is in the way. Let's get him like, ah, let's get him pitchforks. Woo! Revolutions are born, right? For example, a man named uh, uh, Muhammad, he called himself a prophet. Uh, uh, he, he emerged in, in, in the Arabian Peninsula and began to teach idol worshipers about one God. And he converted them to monotheism and told them God's name was Allah. And he began to share his teachings in a lot of North Africa and, and, and Arabia and the Middle East. And the Holy Land was converted to Islam. But in 632, he died. And so his followers were like, hey, we cannot let the teachings of Muhammad die. We got to organize. We got to gather. We got to scatter and share this message. And that makes perfect sense. That's how movements happen. It was in the mid-1990s. Someone was standing in their kitchen. They were frying up a hamburger. Come on, somebody. They were frying up some chicken, some grilled chicken in the frying pan. They said to themselves, it does not make sense. It is not right for my hamburger to be cooked in its own grease. I need a better solution. I need an answer. I wish I had a preaching church today. <laughs> and so a man emerged on the scene unlike any other man with two hamburgers in his hand named George Foreman. And George Foreman said, let me lead you to the promised land. And he opened up the amazing gravity-fed George Foreman grill. And the juices ran down and were collected in a bucket. Somebody say amen. amen. And we all experienced fat-free. Look at your neighbor say fat-free. Grilling. 
If you're Baptist, you're like, we're never coming back. And I appreciate that. I mean, I understand that. I'm just doing what I do. And so millions were sold and a movement was born. There was a man living in Boston with a pretty set up life. He was a teacher and he was a pastor and things were going well for him. But he could not rest with the racial inequalities and injustices that were taking place in the American South. And so Dr. Martin Luther King moved himself from Boston to the heart of the civil rights battle, Montgomery, Alabama. And he began to preach and appeal to the Christianity of Southern whites. And he began to lead the civil rights movement as we know it today. His message was nonviolence. His message was you got to overcome evil with good. And he was un flinching and spoke with an anointing and you could hear his voice and be like this man has been touched by another world and he awakened the consciousness of a nation to begin and there's much more to do to begin the civil rights movement but tragically in 1968 outside the Lorraine Motel in Memphis Tennessee he was violently murdered by an assassin and so his followers got together and said we can't let what Dr. King stood for die. And so they began to organize and they spread out and they began to move in this, in this new method, this new, this new ideology that needed to be spread called the Civil Rights Movement, and that makes sense. But if you read history, how the Jesus Movement took place, a close investigation, or even just an outside investigation of the death of Jesus shows us that's not, that is not how the Jesus Movement happened at all. And there's a reason for that. Like, Jesus' movement wasn't the kind of movement that said, we are, we are going to overthrow the government. <laughs> we are going to go and take what is ours. Join with me. <laughs> no. That was not Jesus' movement. His, his movement was pay your taxes. Ugh. His movement was, let me tell you about the Good Samaritan. His movement was, ah, you need to forgive people 70 times 7, not just once. Like all of this was what Jesus taught, and people were like, ah, that's nice. He's like, I didn't come to tear down the law, I came to fulfill the law. When it came to, when it came to uh, politics and religion, he said, render or give to the government what is the government, and give to God's what is God's. He was not a political revolutionary. He was not a social revolutionary in the sense of, of what people were looking for to get behind him and to create a movement. And so when they got excited about overthrowing the Roman Empire, they were quickly disappointed because Jesus would say, my kingdom's not of this world. And so the problem with Jesus' message is that the message of Jesus centered around Jesus. Like he would tell the stories and he'd say, come to me. All you who are weak and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When, when, when Lazarus died and, and they needed Jesus to come pray and he didn't show up in time, they said, if you'd have been here, he'd have been saved, Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. This is the message of Jesus. When Jesus stepped on the scene and John the Baptist saw him, John the Baptist said, Behold, this is the new editor of our religious periodical magazine that's going to create lots of tumult and excitement regarding this new doctrine. No! He said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. And Jesus is like, Yeah, what's up? You better recognize. Here I am. Rock me like a hurricane. When the disciples of Jesus were trying to figure out, you know, uh, they named this city Augustus and that they're talking about this and, 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 and Jesus looked at him and said, who do men say that I am? And Simon Peter looked at him and said, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus looked at him and said, you know it, that's right, I am. Like, like Jesus said things like, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Like, the movement of Jesus was about Jesus. The movement of Jesus was centered on Jesus. And so, when Jesus died, the movement died with him. When Jesus died, no one believed his message. And with him dead, there was no message. He claimed too much. He made too much of himself. And so it wasn't even that. How many have been watching Live PD on A&E because they got Green County on there? Come on, be honest. Looking for people you know. Watch, it's like doing a documentary on the north side. What's up? Oh, they're going down Kansas and Kearney again. <laughs> and why does everybody have come and go, come and go cups? And everybody's shirtless with come and go cups. All right. 
I'm watching it. I'm like, I know a lot of people in this town. There may be somebody I know, you know. Well, but, but here's the thing about Jesus. Like, his followers didn't wait till he was dead to abandon him. His followers abandoned him when he got arrested. It says in Mark 14 and 50, then all his disciples deserted him and ran away right after he was arrested. People understand something. When it came to Jesus after he was arrested and when he died, nobody believed his message. Nobody laid a stake on his claims. The movement of Jesus died with him. Now, people, I've told you a bunch of times about how Desperately and romantically, I work to woo Renee to marry me. Give me a hand clap right now if you would. She broke up with me time and time again. I traveled across the nation, buying airplane tickets, writing haiku poetry, doing everything I could to woo her, and finally I wooed her. And you know what? When I tell the story, you know how I tell the story? I tell the story like I'm the hero because it's my story to tell. And if you tell a story about yourself, you tell your story like you're the hero, right? Like, I don't tell you about my mistakes if I don't have to, unless I, it's a really good illustration, then I'll do it. <laughs> but like, when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tell about their approach to Jesus, they present themselves as cowards. They present themselves as faithless, faithless. They present themselves as those that do not believe. And so... If you're telling a story, you'd make yourself the hero. But that's not the case at all. There were no heroes. Nobody believed. Nobody was standing outside of the tomb going, All right, everybody, crank up those campfires. Ten. <laughs> Nine. All right, it's time for the mariachi band. Turn them on. Ra, 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 ra. Ra, resurrection. None of that. Nobody was there. He was buried and put in that tomb, and nobody was expecting anything differently. They put guards on it. They put centurions on it. They sealed it up. The movement of Jesus died with him, and nobody was expecting anything differently. I live in what I will loosely call a neighborhood. It's a conglomeration of backwoods cabins, double-wide trailers, and middle-income homes on large pieces of country property. I was driving through my neighborhood the other day and came across this sign. I want you to check it out with me. Oh, yes. This was the sign. I pulled my car to a stop, got out my phone and said, son, take a picture of that. Pastor needs some material. <laughs> and I know white people did this. I just know white people did this. It says, stop. It's supposed to read all the same. Stop, lost pig. Zach and Colby, are you here today? Oh, crap. <laughs> It says, stop, lost pig, don't chase. Of course you got to tell people that. If you lay a fiddle down or you lose a pig somewhere, people in the Ozarks going to run after it and pick it up try to play it, right? <laughs> Fiddles and pigs, it's how it goes. <laughs> and so they, they said, hey, stop, don't chase. Call us ASAP with sightings. Now I want to draw your attention to the extreme care here. Notice that it's not simple gray duct tape. It is cheetah print duct tape because we got to do this thing with a little flair, a little style. And then also notice that the sign has not been put up there with just paper, but it has been put in bisqueen or plastic to preserve it against the elements. This is obviously somebody who cares about their lost pig. I put this on my Facebook page to make fun of it. And then I found out that the people did it, go to Courageous. <laughs> the husband was in my youth group back in the day. Pastor Aaron performed their wedding. They just happened to be in this service. Zach and Colby, are you here? <laughs> I'm getting a cramp. Hold on. Ugh. I want to introduce you to Popcorn the Pig. This is popcorn. Oh, y'all going to go get pet pigs now, I see. Popcorn thinks he's a cow. 
And so when Popcorn sees cows, he busts out of his gate. He goes, he's like, what's up, boys? Let's graze. And he's out there laying around playing with the pigs. That's what Popcorn does. And so Popcorn got away. Colby's an amazing animal lover. She's an animal rescue type person. And so she did everything she could to get this pig back home where it was safe and cared for. But the pig ran free. She was out there on her porch going, Sue, Sue, I'm just preaching. Don't correct me. Sue, calling the pig home because she cared about the pig. And it's been an Easter miracle, people. Popcorn next picture has been brought back. I don't care what the devil intended. God's going to bring it back. Oh, thank you, Popcorn. But nobody was waiting for Jesus. And nobody was expecting Jesus. No one had hope in Jesus because messiahs don't die. The Son of God can't be killed. And you can't crucify the resurrection and the life. So he must have been a fraud. And they were ticked off because they felt like they had been in a three-year Ponzi scheme. Peter said, I go a fishing. They walked away from Jesus and had no expectation. But how is there a church today? Easter solves this mystery. I'm going to read it to you from John 20, verse 1. It says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Do you realize there was no funeral for Jesus? Do you realize that no prayer was prayed for him? Do you realize that no sermons were preached at his funeral? They were going to throw his body on an open grave with other criminals until Joseph of Arimathea begged for the body of Jesus and put him in a borrowed tomb. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She was kind of surprised by that. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that's John talking about himself, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. People, hear me, none of them assumed a resurrection. None of them assumed that Jesus got up from the dead. They assumed somebody had moved him. They assumed something else had happened. Verse 3. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb, but were running, both were running, but the other disciple, that's John talking about himself again, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, he wouldn't go in. He bent over and looked into the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, that's John talking about himself, also went inside. Read these four words with me. He was in the camp of unbelievers until the moment he went into an empty tomb. He had abandoned hope in Jesus. What happened? It wasn't the crucifixion of Jesus that caused these people to believe in him. It was not the teachings of Jesus that caused these people to believe in him. It was not the miracles of Jesus that caused cowards to change their perspective. It was the fact that the tomb was empty, Jesus had resurrected, and it changed their entire mindset to where all of the disciples, save John, died violent deaths as martyrs, refusing to renounce their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because they knew he was real, and they knew he was risen. You may never get all of your questions answered. You may never understand why grandma suffered. It's terrible. We live in a fallen, hurting world. But understand the greatest answer to every problem and solution is that Jesus was who he said he was. He is the Son of God. And if his claims are true, he has salvation and help and hope and life and peace that is unlike anything you can find anywhere else in this entire world. And the church said, yeah. 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 Woo! And so they were changed. And they went out three weeks after Jesus had been crucified, two or three weeks after Jesus had been crucified and resurrected, went and found the people who had said, Crucify him, crucify him. And they started to preaching. These cowards that denied Jesus, that cussed out middle school girls and said, I don't even know him, blankety blank blacker. So Peter did. They stood up and began to preach. And here's their message, Acts 3.15. They preach it like this. Hey, look me in the eyes. You killed the author of life. Ooh, that's strong. 
But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Say witnesses. They said, hey, we have seen it. We know it. We have no doubt that Jesus, who you crucified, who you killed, who you wanted dead, is raised up from the dead. It changed everything. And then Peter got up and started preaching in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And he says, look, repent, every one of you. Turn from your sin and be baptized. We have the opportunity for everybody that wants to be water baptized to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus today. To be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They preached a four-point sermon. You killed him. God raised him. We've seen him. Now say you're sorry. They went from being cowards to being convinced. They went from not believing to believing because the resurrection is the proof of Jesus in Christianity. I don't have time to break it down, but Jesus was seen by what the Bible calls many unfailable proofs. He was seen by up to 600 people. He let Thomas, who doubted, touch the nail prints in his hands and feel the piercings in his feet and thrust his hand into the side of his body where a sword had been pierced inside of him. Understand that those people that saw Jesus could not be talked out of it. The people who saw Jesus could not be talked out of it. And it spread like wildfire. It spread like nothing else. And today there are two billion or more believers that say Jesus is my Lord and Savior because I've met him through the power of his Spirit. The reason you can trust that he rose from the dead is that there's no other explanation as to why we even know that carpenter ever lived. He would have been nothing, nobody of insignificance except the fact that he did what he said he was going to do, which is get up on the third day. I don't believe Jesus rose because the Bible tells me so. I believe it because people who didn't believe were forever changed and martyred because of their extreme belief in Jesus Christ. It's time to say deuces to excuses. It's time to believe in the word of God as it is broken to us in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the beautiful message of Jesus and it's for everybody, all races, all nationalities everybody it's for you would you bow your heads with me today